Thanks, Carl, for that introduction and uh, for the opportunity to come and speak uh, to Citrus. Uh, um, I am uh, on a brief uh, sabbatical here in Berkeley from my position at the, the University of Oslo Center for Development and Environment. And it's great to be able to have the opportunity to bring some of the insights from my own research and from the research of people working at our, our center here uh, to, the, to, to you guys. Um, <clears throat> I don't like uh, long wordy slides, but I thought I would really t try to articulate the aims here in a few uh, long sentences. Uh, I've got an ambitious uh, agenda here today. Um, I want to make uh, these related arguments that I lay out here. Uh, one, that living in and with a culture framed by growth has led to high energy habits that would be very difficult to break and reset at lower levels of carbon energy. Uh, and one of the main points of my lecture is that habits have been ignored, daily routines, the knowledge that forms around it, and they provide a kind of glue or inertia to change that we're not really addressing properly. Habits are grounded in a form of knowledge that has been largely neglected in energy research and policy, what I call experiential knowledge or, pra or sometimes called practical knowledge, uh, as opposed to cognitive reflexive knowledge that we often uh, focus on when we're providing information and incentives to people to save energy. And a policy engagement uh, with habits will need to facilitate practical learning, I'll get into what I mean by that, and support community experiments that premier prosperity, uh, a broader definition of where we want to go with our economy uh, in lieu of growth, uh, achieved with a low env environmental impact. Um, many of us, including Carl and I, who met here in the early 1980s, uh, have been working uh, to make to achieve inner re research and policies to achieve inner re reductions and carbon reductions for many, many years. Uh, this constantly within a macroeconomic framing that encourages and, in fact, is dependent on economic growth. Uh, and I claim that now, after four decades since we began this work after the oil shocks in the 1970s, and three decades after climate change emerged on the international agenda, uh, with the publication of the Brundtland Report, Our Common Future, that was actually the Prime Minister of Norway, where I'm now working, that we now have su sufficient empirical evidence to state with confidence that deep reductions in energy use are not going to happen within a growth framework. Now, it would be nice at the end of the lecture to come back and, and discuss this with you, but that's, that's one of my uh, experiences. It's no longer an epistemological debate. I think it's actually we have empirical evidence that this is simply not going to happen. There's a, there's a surging acknowledgement of this by researchers in a wide swath of academic disciplines, including economics. We were discussing that before the lecture. But surprisingly few efforts have thus far been made to theorize deeply anchored associations between more energy, more consumption, and better lives. And that association could be labeled as the fundaments of what I call a growth, a growth culture. Formed in this country and other Western countries through over a century of lived experience uh, in a culture of growth and expansive capitalism. This has led to a habituation to high energy consumptions associated with a, uh, with a number of, of practices, central practices that I'll be talking about today. It's extremely problematic for what I call the low energy or low carb carbon transformation. So in this lecture, I will articulate the relationship between the politics of expansion and the formation of high energy habits with most of my attention devoted to house, household and residence. Now, we could expand this to other sectors, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on that today. Um, I will reflect on the, th on the theory of habit and its implications for the politics of unlocking and reforming low energy habits. But I think I, I need to begin with, with a rationale and evidence of, of some of the sense of urgency for, for making this, this change. Why do we need to do it? Um, so, you know, we all know about these kinds of graphs uh, with carbon dioxide pointing up and to the right. Um, there was a report by World Watch Institute just last week that global CO2 emissions in 2012 are 58% higher than they were in 1990. And if those of you who know the Brundtland report and came back to the 1986 publication of Our Common Future know that they were projecting at that time that 60 to 80% reductions in energy use would be necessary 
in order to av avoid disastrous uh, climate change. So that's a huge, huge gap. And what was said that was needed to be done back in the 1980s and, and where we are today. And finally, after lots of stagnated efforts to make conventions, global conventions on climate, we now maybe see a little bit of emphasis. I, I noticed in the paper today that, that the President of France and, and Obama were now saying that we're going to aim for, for, 40, for, 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 for bigger reductions. We're going to try to get the issue back on the agenda in Paris at the meetings on climate next year. The European Union has just announced a 40, effort for 40% reductions in, in carbon emissions by 2030. Uh, so we're finally reframing the ambition level in terms of what we need to do, but I still think we're working within a paradigm that's going to be making that very difficult to make it happen. Uh, British economist, ecological economist Tim Jackson has calculated that if the global economy keeps expanding at the current rate, it will be 80 times bigger in 2100 than it was in 1950. So, so it's just absurd for me to imagine that the global ecosystem can continue to thrive or even to survive the massive demands on energy resources and the race and the waste generated by an economy of that size. This is another slide that I like to use uh, to illustrate the urgency. I mean, this is about ecological footprint, global ecological footprint and the balance between the biocapacity and, and uh, human activities on the Earth. And what's interesting to note is that um, about the time that the Brundtland Report was published in 1986, we were at one-to-one. -one. That's where we should be. And what they're showing is in 2006 here, we're already about using about 1.5 biosystems. That can't continue very long, and yet the projection is that it is going to continue. What they call the ecological debt is going to... Uh, continue to, to increase. Uh, just one more, if you look at the, these projections by the U, uh, U.S. Inf Energy Information Agency that look back to 1990 and forward to, to, to 2035, uh, there are lots of, lots of things that are interesting from this graph. One is that over the period um, from 1990 forward to today, with all of these ambitious efforts to reduce uh, energy consumption. Uh, we've done a lot about increasing our, the, inf the efficiency of production, the efficiency of consumption, but the, in the OECD countries, in the rich countries of the world, uh, energy consumption has continued to increase. And I'm, that's back to my empirical ev evidence statement earlier that we haven't really managed to make uh, any reductions in the energy, total global or OECD energy consumption. And then, of course, the other thing that's interesting about this slide is that the world is not standing still that other uh, d d countries are emerging and coming online and using energy for basic development, for putting infrastructures for electricity into place, for building networks, uh, for automobility, uh, and, uh, and uh, bigger houses, and, and going through many of the transformations that the rich countries today went through uh, in uh, arriving at the high energy consumption levels that we're at today. So, so th these are the projections forward to 2035. That doesn't look very optimistic. It doesn't look very good, thinking back to the, the ecosystem uh, implications of that. So some, something has got to give. Um, and, of course, renewable energies are going to probably take some of that uh, production burden in coming decades. But I think, and I, and I think a lot of others do too, that given the relatively low prices and the abundance of fossil fuels, especially coal, uh, coal, coal production is still very cheap, market prices are still very, there's lots of it out there, um, that you know, scenarios by the International Energy Agency and others show that renewables will all, only take a small dent out of the increasing energy use in, com, in, in the coming decades. And you know, the conclusion from that is that we must reduce the production and consumption of energy if we were to, to have a, ch a chance of avoiding disastrous climate change. And we are currently locked into a pattern that are, are, is far from delivering um, reductions. And I just want to underline the point that this relates to what sociologist Max Weber said a few years ago, that our, quote, model of the economy, economy society, and the subject endows all of its members with a biographical model that stipulates interminable self-transcendent growth. And this model affects the way we approach resource extraction, production, and consumption. 
Uh, another an ecologist, a German ecologist, Harald Welzer, captured this when he's about resource extraction when he says that in a, in a very interesting book entitled How Growth Entered the World in Our Souls, <laughs> uh, if oil is in short supply, drill deeper. Um, if water is scarce, desalinate the sea. If fish stocks are dwindling, travel further out. Uh, very little focus on consumption because that really goes to the heart of our conceptions of the good, the good life. Um, consumption has either been an indifferent variable, in other words, it's been left alone, we'll just increase efficiency and allow consumption to travel upward, uh, or has been outright encouraged to grow. Uh, remember George Bush after 2001, 9-11, uh, uh, you know, to demonstrate that we were still living the American way of life, we should go out and shop. That was one. And, uh, and I think that says something very interesting about our, our culture. In every aspect of daily life, including the acquisition and consumption of food, shelter, cleaning, travel, and recreation, the drive for more, bigger, and faster are counteracting efforts to reduce energy use and carbon emissions. If you take a longer perspective, these drives are very interesting. These are, these are drives are of 20th century phenomenon. Uh, anthropolog anthropologist Richard Robbins <laughs> writes how in 19th century America, culture was characterized by moderation, thrift, and frugality, and uh, that these values, these qualities, were also revived in, uh, in relation to the Great Depression of the 1930s and into the early 1940s and, and World War II. Uh, but from the mid-century, 1950s onward, this uh, frugality has waned as as a as a uh, important aspect of social performance, if you want to put it that way. And more consumption has been positively valued in vir virtually every every sector of life. One way we can see the physical manifestations of this are just in the, in the infrastructures around around houses and. Uh, and uh, it's very interesting. From, from the, the mid-20th century, the sizes of homes, numbers of rooms, quantity of furnishings has steadily increased in the U.S. and all the other OECD countries. The advent of uh, multiple living rooms, bathrooms, and so on, uh, which obviously place a, a greater demand on, on energy use. I've looked at this in Norway, uh, and Norway is not atypical from the average OECD country. And you can see here, uh, this is historical data from the, the Bureau of Statistics in Norway on housing size, and the blue line is meters, total meters square, total, total housing size. That has increased by one and a half times over the period from 1960 to 2000. And another very interesting uh, graph is when you calculate it per capita or per person, that there's been a tripling and the per person uh, a access to house space in that same period. Now, why would the per capita be increasing faster than the total space? Because families are getting smaller, people are living longer, there's more divorce, separation, um, and um, it's uh, very interesting that in, in Oslo and many Scandinavian cities today, around 50% of all dwellings, that is houses and apartments, have only one occupant, 50%. Now, what does that structurally do to the energy load? You know, when we have bigger houses making heavier demands on, on heating energy and cooling energy in the tropical climates, uh, and we have <clears throat> more appliances, if you will, per person. I mean, a household with five people using one refrigerator is more efficient in some sense than, than three houses using three refrigerators. So, so, so this is a kind of a structural thing that we see happening, and also my, my research in India shows it's happening there too. You get increasing uh, house sizes, decreasing family sizes, and a, and, a, and a structural demand on energy consumption that we need to think some more about. Um, and I've taken on uh, several of these. Uh, let's see, what are I want to do here? Yeah. So, so back to the point of how do we get a hold of these issues in our research around uh, consumption and the social dimensions of consumption. Uh, and I say again that the habits of growth have been largely overlooked 
and mainstream energy research and policy, which is still granted in a model of consumption uh, that, that is characterized by two deeply seated assumptions. Uh, oh, I wanted to show you, oh, sorry, refrigerators. Let's, let's do that too. Yeah. Uh, this is a refrigerator from 1970, and I'm sorry, but this actually was taken in 2011, and that is a 1970 refrigerator, so, so it doesn't look too good. But if, if we had a picture of when it was installed, it would have looked a lot better. Uh, and, uh, but, but you just see the, 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 the difference. And you know, as, as we have generation, generationally grown up with bigger and bigger refrigerators, we kind of forget that you know, it was only 30 or 40 years ago that people were getting by with this. And obviously, the size of the refrigerator, too, uh, has lots of uh, con consequences for other home practices, including the way we shop, the way we, kinds of food that we eat, and, and so on. So there, there are many related practices, all having indirect and direct energy uses that are, that are associated with the, the growth of the house and the, and the growth of uh, refrigeration. Uh, and I'll come back and say a few more words about those a bit later. But I wanted to get to these standard assumptions in mainstream energy research and policy. Um, one is that energy consumption is an action or activity driven by sovereign, economically rational individual consumers. It ignores the social, social world, ignores the influence of the material world that has already built up around us and structures the way we consume in different ways. And another assumption is that increasing technical and market efficiency can accomplish all of the work of reducing energy consumption. That seems to be where we are. I don't know, some of you may disagree, but, but that's the way I see it from my uh, perspective. Um, and I have taken on these two assumptions in a number of uh, publications over the years. Um, and I'd just like to outline some of the issues here. Obviously, don't have time to go into all of them. But um, concerning the efficiency assumptions, uh, again, if we go back to the record, uh, it shows that there have, in fact, been significant increases in economic efficiency and technical efficiency in the OECD countries over the past decades. The global energy intensity is now 33% of what it was in 1970. Energy intensity in both the U.S. and the United Kingdom is 40% uh, lower than it was in, in 1980. But as we have seen, um, energy use uh, continues uh, to increase. So I say that efficiency is a means, a very important means, and I don't mean to say that we have to stop pushing and working, expanding the envelope of our work on energy efficiency, but in a growth economy, efficiency often leads to these so-called rebound effects, and I don't know how many of you have been into to the, to these. Uh, so, so a lot of the, the problems that I'm capturing in this lecture, people have tried to put them in the, in the context of rebound effect. Um, put succinctly, the rebound effect means that uh, cons consumption of energy of efficient products in an expanding economy frees up money for more consumption. Either the same service, such as transport, space heat, or hot water, or the com consumption of other products or services that use energy, thus negating the energy savings in the original purchase. That's the rebound. Um, for manufacturers, actually, um, rebound has been a goal. You know, assets and capital feed up from, freed up from increased technical, technical efficiency or from its cousin increased labor productivity are purposefully generated and invested in growth in the forms of more products and more profits. So once again, we have productivity efficiency very important for other goals in our societies, but, but not having... having negative consequences, in a sense, for the, for the total energy use, total carbon emissions, and the other ecological aspects related to, to growth. And in recent articles, I've argued that maybe a better metaphor is prebound than rebound, uh, because our entire economic and social system is orienting to capturing the gains from efficiency and applying them to growth. So how would you one expect us to, to think or operate otherwise? Uh, Rebound is pre-programmed in the, in, the in the paradigm that we're operating under today. Um, so again, please don't misunderstand me. I know many of you are doing excellent work on technical and economic efficiency. It's crucial for the effort to reduce energy use. But my, my claim is that it will not be sufficient as long as the overarching aim continues to be a growing economy and an increase in production and consumption of the things that, that, that use energy. Um, 
Now, if we, uh, that's the second point. If we go to this first point, uh, which is very interesting for the non-economic social scientists, and there have been a milieu built up that has studied this for years. Uh, uh, Carl funded some of us back here in, uh, in the University of California system in the early 80s to begin, to begin looking at it. Um, it actually reduces uh, the social world to an economic world. And that economic world is very important. Uh, people are economically rational in some senses, but they have to be weighed and balanced against other things in our lives. And one of them is what I call experiential knowledge or, or practical knowledge. And an inspiration for insights on, on practical knowledge is the work of Pierre Bourdieu and Marcel Nuss, uh, French social scientist, most was an anthropologist. And these were very important in the theorizing of consumption and social change in the 1980s. They sort of got dropped and put aside in the mainstream social science turned to postmodernism and individualism that followed in the 1980s and 1990s. But I think there's much to be learned to go back and look at that material. Um, what is practical knowledge? Knowledge that is created and per perpetuated through performance of a practice, a practice like eating or dressing or, or, or transporting ourselves in a given sociocultural space. Practical knowledge uh, predisposes or influences new performances of the practice. Practices performed reg regularly in stable material environments, such as the home, can lead to habits that are resistant to cognitive deductive uh, arguments for change. That's the fundamental step in a new way of theorizing uh, cons uh, consumption that acknowledges habits. Um, that I think is, is very important. Um, and I mentioned the objects which are involved. I've mentioned that several times, the size of the house, the size of the river. These, these are also uh, uh, very important to understanding how we consume so that individuals have their cognitive knowledge. They have their information about what's happening in the world. They understand how they want to change their own lives and move forward. Uh, but we are... Also, we have to also consider that that is conditioned and constrained by the material world that we're involved with. Um, and we see in places like India and China, air conditioners, refrigerators, and other appliances coming in that we've become habituated to, and these are changing consumption in very interesting ways that in general are leading also to more, more energy use. We have to get a hold on, on, on these changes. And... Practical knowledge is the glue that holds habits together. If you think about your own lives and how you operate, I think you would, be, uh, you would find yourselves uh, dealing with, with habits. Um, how we walk, how we wash ourselves, uh, how we eat, how we transport ourselves, and in fact, we even purposively try to create habits in a sense uh, in sports, activities and dance in the military when we all learn to march. I mean, you know, habits, habits are there and they're important and they're not all negative. I mean, doing something habitually can also give you time to reflect about other things as you're moving through the motions. So habits are not all negative. But in some ways, I think they're directed uh, in today's world uh, towards a habituation to high energy habits around cars, around uh, air conditioning, around bigger refrigerators and so on. Um, so we need to do something about habits. We need to understand that they are related to material contexts and, and, and uh, infrastructures. And we need to work on, I mean, so, so the, the question would be then, what, if once we understand habits, how can we theorize changes in habits or transformation in habits? And that's a difficult question. As I said, uh, deductive arguments that say you should eat this kind of food or you should do this kind of shopping and so on uh, can have some impact in the longer term. But we, are, we also need to have other forms for incentives uh, that are going to affect the way we do our habitual practices that, that, that use energy. Uh, one example is to work with a material, obvious example, is to work with a material backdrop. And uh, in urban areas and in, in cities, um, one... Uh, thing that can be done is to work with the infrastructures around public transportation and bicycling. These are fairly well known. 
But I think another optimistic thing that's happening over the last decade is a really surge in interest in redesigning and restructuring cities for bicycling and walking. Uh, because there was a long period when uh, even sidewalks were taken out of small towns in America. I went back to mine that I grew up in Texas. People were so accustomed to the car that they didn't need the sidewalks anymore. You could provide more road you know, by, by taking away the sidewalk. Well, now I think there's, there's a mentality returning that we, we need to enable uh, new kinds of uh, practices and, and, and habits around transportation uh, through the provision of safe and secure infrastructures. And many European cities have taken this seriously. Um, Carl, you were just in Copenhagen, so you saw the bicycle infrastructures there. They're incredible. I don't know if the rest of you have been there, but uh, Copenhagen, I would say, gives more attention to bicyclers than they do to automobiles. I mean, they have, there's been a revolution that's happened there. And over 40% of commuting within Greater Copenhagen is done by bicycle today. To me, that's an amazing statistic. Uh, Stockholm now has 750 kilometers of bike paths. Gothenburg, 450. Paris has built 600 kilometers of bike paths over the last 10 years. And a lot of people said, okay, well, you enable it, but are people actually going to take advantage of it and use it? And I, I say yes. I think there is also concomitantly an interest in health and in training. And you know, there, there are certainly ways that people are seeing that they can combine working out and getting to work uh, in, in, in one, uh, and avoiding the issues of, of, of parking, uh, finding a parking space and paying for parking and tolls and so on. Lisbon is a very good example. I don't know if anybody is Portuguese, but um, uh, the Lisbon authorities decided uh, to build a safe structure for, for bicycling. Maybe there were many people who said, no, it'll never work in Portugal because we're, we're, we all wear coats and ties to work and we want to look you know, very nice when we get there and so on. And actually, after it was completed for about six months, uh, they were all saying, yeah, we told you so. It wasn't working. But as people began to experiment and use the bicycles and practice in different ways, they, uh, how, how and experience how the bicycling uh, worked, uh, there has been an, an, a rapidly increasing use of those infrastructures and a complete change in the mentality around, <coughs> around bicycling in Lisbon. Uh, so these infrastructure changes have enabled changes in urban transport and have reduced this terrible problem that we have with automobility. Yeah, well, practical knowledge is related to something called cultural learning. Uh, you know, and it's back to this whole idea of how do people make changes and how do we make decisions. And um, <clears throat> deductive information is one thing. How much money you can save, how long the payback time is going to be. These are the things we've been hammering on for a long time. But I would say also that we need to provide spaces for experimentation and learning. Um, and that is happening in a number of places, and, uh, including, uh, I think, Davis, California is actually a good example of where people, we've been using demonstration projects, allowing people to see and participate in new ways of doing things in terms of low energy houses and, and bike paths and redesigned uh, neighborhoods, recycling, uh, that have had great success. It requires a greater investment in that kind of incentive package, obviously, than, than would sending out a packet of black and white information on how you can improve your health or how much uh, money you can save by doing this and that. But over the longer term, and that's how we need to think, uh, I believe that it can uh, be facilitate uh, experimentation and, and, and change. Uh, and when experimentation is not possible, we have found in, in several projects in, in Scandinavia recently that providing access to the experiences of peers who have tried new things and colleagues and neighbors and family is also a powerful, powerful tool. We did a study in, um, in Norway recently about people who have installed uh, heat pumps in their homes where you know, Norway has a very high heating load, electrical heating load. 70% of electricity in Norway goes to space heating. It's really cold there. Um, and, uh, and heat pumps have the potential uh, to reduce uh, electricity loads by up to 60%. Uh, I won't go into the technology now, maybe some of you know it, but, but they're very, very expensive. And uh, there have been problems getting them out there in Norway, uh, even though the payback times are fairly short, given the, the amount of savings that, that can be 
uh, captured in a, very, in a short period of time. But we have found that uh, new kinds of incentives which provide information to people about how their others who have bought a heat pump have experienced it, putting them in contact with networks of people who have installed and how they installed and what the, their positive and negative experiences are with the, with the heat pumps has been a very powerful, much more powerful way to spread the, the, the idea of, of heat pumps and to actually uh, encourage people to invest, invest in heat pumps in Norway. So, so, so that is a kind of a secondary uh, principle derived from the same idea that, by, that it, allowing opportunities for experimentation with new practices uh, in the long term is one of the ways that we need to, to, to work to, to help people to, to change. Uh, but if we can provide information about their peers and people just like them who have made similar kinds of changes, uh, that that's another uh, positive uh, kind of information. Finally, we can learn from the explosion of experiments that are going on with low carbon living at the community level around the world. And these, these, this is the place that, that that gives uh, reason for optimism. Uh, at the community level, many communities have, have linked up, for example, into something called the Transition Movement, which was originally called Transition Towns. In 2009, there were 134 communities around the world officially registered as, as members of the Transition Movement. And in order to be able to join the movement, a community must commit to participatory planning and implicit to the goals must be an alternative political framing that is non-capitalist in a sense, yet incorporates a positive vision rather than one of denial or simplicity, which are simply not working. That's not the way to go to encourage change. Uh, I would say that these new communities, transition communities, represent new forms for micropolitics uh, that encapsulate a different vision of prosperity than the growth-dependent uh, vision. And we really have an interesting uh, research agenda set out for us to, to try to understand how the dynamics at this, this local level are working, how people are experiencing it. I've uh, got a project coming up where I'm going to be looking at one of these commu communities in Norway. I have several PhD students and, and master students looking at this. Uh, and how, how are the, the dynamics of participatory change, experimental change at the community working level, and how can public policy come in and support are built up under under those changes because I because I think that is uh, is it really an area that that change from the bottom up which for me in my academic much of my academic career I was skeptical to uh, you know making the middle class out there in the suburbs uh, uh, consider that they could have a different way of organizing themselves which was less uh, environmentally intrusive. Uh, and appealing to values like environmentalism and idealism, uh, this didn't seem to be working. But I think, I think that the, the actual, again, by communicating the practical experiences of these communities, we have a, a huge potential for, for generating uh, a growth and, and, and maybe a, a broader change in, in the societies. And another interesting phenomenon that's happening, some of you may be looking at it, I don't know, is uh, the interest in um, sharing and, uh, and cooperation in a number of different areas, goods and services, such as recycling, uh, reuse, uh, house sharing, car sharing. Um, these are growing very rapidly. They are facilitated by the possibility to do this uh, in terms of virtual communities on the Internet. If you, if you search on the internet for collaboration or collaborative consumption, you'll find thousands and thousands of different ways of doing it now. And I, th I think in general that I don't have time to develop how that the concrete effects of that on direct energy use would be, but I think it's pretty easy to see that they, they would be uh, positive. An optimistic interpretation of these uh, transition and collaborative initiatives is that a new set of ideas about consumption, growth, and the good life are being put into practice. Uh, that includes sociality, uh, health of the environment, self-determination, and deceleration. And this needs, uh, needs to be supported uh, by public policy and uh, communicated. Uh. All right, so in conclusion, 
I would say that there are good reasons for questioning whether drives for growth, productivity, efficiency, and accelerating lifestyles actually do lead to more satisfying lives. And at our institute, we have several people looking at this, the relationship between uh, consumption, energy consumption, quality of life, well-being issues, very interesting work. A range of different alternative visions exist, yet there is a discouraging scarcity of national and transnational political alternatives. Maybe someone else can tell me where that's happening. I mean, we, we see um, in Europe now a much more aggressive uh, set of policies that are directed towards the climate reductions, but, but most of the attention in the last five years after the economic collapse has been on how to increase economic growth how to increase competitiveness within the European Union. And, I, and many of us feel that there's been a receding away from this strong interest in going right to the top and examining the economic framing and looking at how that is, can be changed in order to accommodate the, the ecological uh, effects of our everyday lives. Um, there's a dire need to come up with pragmatic alternatives to current policies and practices, and uh, I hope that many of you will find a way to contribute. I think it really is sort of the, 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 Marshall, the Marshall Fund <laughs> challenge of our times, uh, the, the post-World War II efforts to, to, to build Europe, massive amounts of uh, attention, money, and... and uh, and commercial interest in, in doing that, and I think that's, that's what we need uh, if we're going to accomplish uh, this radical reduction in energy use and climate emissions that we need to do if we're going to maintain the ecological stability of the planet. Thank you. That's for questions. Uh, uh, I'll take one here and, and um, do speak into the microphone because we're going to keep this on record. <laughs> so I think you know, there's a fair amount of people that agree with the idea uh, that relentless um, economic growth uh, is a problem. Um, and on the practical side, how do you get out of this cycle wherein without economic growth, our current economic system breaks down, where economic growth is most generally the best predictor of the electoral chances of the incumbent politicians. Uh, we seem to be locked in this pattern which would, is very difficult to release ourselves from. Um, and that, that's just not a, you know, a sort of psychological mentality of like wanting greater economic growth. That's in terms of the practical economics of our, that we're, the structure we're operating in. That's the, one of the $64,000 questions, as we used to say it. Uh, you know, the, the, we are so embedded uh, at all levels of society in the associations of prosperity with uh, consumption of more that it's, it, it's almost disheartening to think about how we can go about, about changing that. And as I said, uh, I don't see many optimistic, positive efforts at the level of national or, national or transnational politics. Um, but I don't think that those issues should be a barrier for us to start thinking about how uh, that paradigmic e economic assumption is affecting uh, the environment. And, and sort of turning things around and saying that that's got to be a point of departure for reevaluating the ways we think about our political economies. Uh, but I have to say that the most interesting things that are happening today are not at the national level or at the transnational level, they're at the community level. And I think here, as I said, there is a microeconomics of politics, and we have had at our university, we've invited a conference where we've invited mayors, mayors from around Europe. Uh, who are, are part of uh, these transition communities and other efforts to, to reduce energy use, and to hear their rhetoric and their discussion of how they put economic growth into perspective and are now using new terminologies like prosperity and so on, working on new ways of dividing labor, for example. I mean, one of the classic ways to do this is that people work less and we share, we share labor and so on. But, but I think at that level there are things happening that could eventually inform the national and transnational debates. 
That's all I can say. Um, I was wondering if um, maybe some of the findings in behavioral sciences might be useful in uh, winning hearts and minds. Uh, so, for instance, uh, one of the reasons I think we have giant refrigerators is because we have so many choices. I think uh, Schwartz points out that if you go to a supermarket, there are 200 different kinds of cookies you can choose from. Yeah. So if you get back to your old 1970 refrigerator and you only have one or two kinds of meat, I mean, what kind of piker are you, right? <laughs> but it turns out that actually people are less happy when they have more choice. They don't realize this, um, but they are. And uh, you might also point out that many people are happier if they experience things rather than buy stuff. Exactly, yeah. And so it's conceivable that uh, by making people more aware of the utilities of frugality, like retiring early rather than having a garage of five cars for two people, that <laughs> those things might be useful in both reducing our consumption and, and increasing the quality of people's lives. It's a very good point. And lots of research, recent research shows that, that once you reach a certain level of consumption at the household, that your sense of well-being flattens out, you know, and as you consume more and more, it doesn't really increase it. One of my pet peeves is, and I don't, I'd like to give time for more quick, but I, I just have to say this, and that is in the world of energy, you know, our standards and labeling for refrigerators uh, divide refrigerators into class sizes, right? Yeah. Uh, so we have, we, we have a massive refrigerator that could be as big as this wall that could have an A on it in a European <laughs> labeling yeah. because it's very efficient compared to other refrigerators of that class. Uh, what we need is a labeling and a standards that, that, if, that looks at total consumption, right? And then we, then we would be able to assess, you know, the, uh, the, the total energy consumption and the difference between those various rates. So, so th this is one uh, thing that I need. We definitely need a reorientation on. Um, how does the new economic model affect the number of jobs available? And in particular, how would it affect the middle class and the lower middle class? I'm seeing some of the, the nice trends that you're dis being discussed here, mostly taking part in the, maybe the uppermost quartile. But you know, what are the big masses going to do, and how are they going to respond to the, what they're seeing would be the right thing? But maybe it's, it's just not going to happen. Another big question. I, I think uh, an effort to reduce consumption in the middle classes and elites could potentially make more resources available to the society as a whole and, uh, and, and for the, for the, the less uh, economically uh, advantaged uh, at this time. And uh, there's a book, a recent book called The Spirit Level. I don't know if anybody has seen that. It's very popular in Europe, which examines societies around the world. It examines uh, those that are, have the most aggressive energy reduction policy, climate policies, those that are most redistributive also in terms of, of uh, how resources are, are distributed within the societies. And it shows that those, the societies that are, have the less differences between the rich and the, and the less advantaged are, are those which are most environmentally friendly. Um, so that, that's, that's, that's worth looking at. You know? So I think redistributed policies, which are not really big in the United States, <laughs> But, but are really characteristic of, uh, for example, the Scandinavian economies. And these happen to be the ones I think they're doing the most uh, towards pressing forward a new kind of yeah. paradigm. The, the, the spirit level. The spirit level. Was in it. So I agree with you that the most interesting uh, innovative work right now is happening more at the community and municipal level in part because the state and national and multinational level seems to be paralyzed at doing anything about uh, carbon legislation or any real commitments. I'm wondering if you could talk about who you think is doing the most interesting work, be it ICLE or C40 or what campaigns or, or organizations out there do you think is doing the most interesting cutting edge work at that community and municipal level? And also, can you talk a little bit about how to bring in big corporations who now think it's very trendy to be sustainable, yet there's no real benchmark or police saying what is sustainable and what's not. So we have a lot of greenwashing out there. But how can you shift that paradigm to turn it into something that's actually truly green and productive? You guys are asking the very <laughs> big, tough question. Uh, yeah, the, I, I, what, what I see happening in, in Europe, anyway, is more and more conferences of people like uh, commissioners in the European Union that are convening conferences of mayors who are making changes and, learning and learn, trying to learn from them. I don't see how that is particularly converted into a new form 
for uh, framing economic paradigms yet. Hmm. But, uh, but I think it's a, it's, it's a, it's a way to move that, uh, it's, it's an interesting move where I, which I think is partly fueled by a sort of desperation. You know, we don't know where to go. We have to make these commitments. Uh, how, do you, how do you achieve 40% lower carbon by 2030? Uh, within the, the, the business as usual paradigm that most of us are operating under. So that's one issue. The other issue about, about greenwashing, uh, that, that's a tough one too. Um, we, we obviously need to create a demand for uh, green products and lower energy products. Everybody knows that. Um, how we get these transnational companies to adhere to National guidelines on uh, consumption and efficiency, that's another question I don't think anybody has the answer to, and I certainly don't yet. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to ask, what is being done about in forming intentional communities where people or friends can live next door to each other? Because uh, the problem with, with uh, the current space is that everybody lives next to strangers. I mean, if you look at a map, you know, look at your list of friends and how far are you away from your friends and how far are you away from the things you like to do? I mean, the, the problem is, is not that everybody seems to be beating on this problem from the top down, from large governments and large corporate entities. But what about the, the most significant action that we can do, and that is freedom of location and the unification of space. Freedom of location allows friends to live next to each other and then they will tend to share, you know, resources much better than just simply having a bunch of strangers live next to each other. I'm talking about not just neighborhoods, but communities. And uh, I don't, I've been looking up on the web on intentional communities, but unfortunately the only large and unintentional community is the world's armed forces. They are what you call the largest unintentional community. Um, the they thing get, is... They get a lot of funding, too. Yeah, so why can't we have you know, intentional communities or communities where people choose to live next to each other, friends that are close rather than a bunch of strangers living next door to each other. Anyway, freedom of location is probably would be the most significant thing in kicking off this new way of living. And the unifications of space will fuse the, the feeling of what's inside and what's outside. And I'll just last few words is, that I have is, is about the, the dichotomous use of space, and there are two versions of the dichotomous use of space. One is the uh, technical description of space, and that the outside represents variety, but it does so at the cost of being austere, and the inside is comfortable, but it does so by being very confining. And the last word is a romantic uh, description, is, is the outside is is a, uh, a quest for adventure and a longing for home. Anyway, thanks. <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for those insights. Uh, I, I think your, 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 your comments on the, on the sense of community are, are, are relevant. Uh, a lot of the communities in which these uh, kinds of participatory, dynamic, purposeful changes are happening are in smaller communities. Uh, around the around the world, other people may have other examples. A really hard nut to crack is some of these uh, suburban uh, neighborhoods and, and large uh, areas, where, as you say, many people don't feel a sense of community. So, so there is a, a definite issue in and re-emerging, redefining a sense of, of community. How do we go about that in in these greater urban areas? And 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 that's on the research agenda for the future. I don't have an answer. Thank you.